Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there. From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday, and Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter at Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram, just search for Bairdo37. It is one of the most recognizable structures not only in Canada, but worldwide. The CN Tower is something many Canadians feel pride over, but what was involved in its construction? Today I am looking at the building of the structure that was once the tallest in the world. In the 1960s, Toronto began to see skyscrapers pop up across the city, and while it showed the city moving into the modern era, it caused issues with communications for existing transmission towers. They were not high enough to broadcast over existing buildings, and the signals bounced off buildings, creating poor television and radio reception. The city had been expanding heavily, reaching a population of 1 million in the 1950s, and by 1970 there were 2.5 million people, many dealing with poor television reception. The original idea for the CN Tower came about in 1968, when the Canadian National Railway was looking to build a television and radio platform that would serve the Toronto area. Another goal of the tower would be to demonstrate the strength of not only the Canadian National Railway, but also Canadian industry itself. The entire project was going to be part of the Metro Centre proposal, a $1 billion joint plan between Canadian Pacific and Canadian National to convert the surplus railway lands of that area into the largest revitalization scheme ever conducted in North America. The plan was to have apartment buildings that would house 20,000 people as well as terraced homes, 418,000 square metres of new office space, and 55,000 square metres of commercial property. The Metro Centre would also separate automobile, pedestrian and transit traffic through various levels. And the most important piece of the entire development was a freestanding structure that would rise above everything. In an article from the time, the Toronto Star wrote, quote, This would be Canada's tallest structure of any kind and one of the tallest self-supporting structures in the world. Work on the Metro Centre was scheduled to begin in 1969, but even with the approval from the city, the planning stalled, and delays would begin until 1975 when the plan was scrapped completely. One item would remain in the plan, though, the CN Tower. By this point, Canadian Pacific had also dropped out of the project, leaving only Canadian National. There was worry from aviation experts that the tower would be a hazard for aircraft using the Hamilton Airport and the Toronto International Airport. The Canadian Owners and Pilots Association would say in a press release, quote, Sooner or later, an aircraft is bound to strike it, possibly killing people in the tower and on the ground as well as those in the aircraft. End quote. Another concern was migratory birds, since Toronto is part of a vital travel route for birds. David Crombie, the city alderman and future mayor, tried unsuccessfully to have the height of the tower cut by two-thirds in response to those concerns. For the next few years, plans for the tower would change and evolve until it received the official go-ahead in 1972. The final design came from John Andrews, Webb Zarefa, E.R. Baldwin, and Menkes Husen. The first step was to analyze and test the soil at the site of construction to assess the condition of the bedrock and determine how it would react to changes in hydrostatic pressure. Upon testing the bedrock, the engineers soon realized they would be able to make the CN Tower the tallest building in the world. Contracted to the Canada Cement Company, construction began on February 6, 1973 with a massive excavation of the tower base for the purpose of constructing the foundation. In order to accomplish this, 56,000 tons of earth and shale were removed to a depth of 49.2 feet at the centre. Once the area was excavated, the base was constructed using 7,000 cubic metres of concrete, 
with 450 tons of rebar and 3 tons of steel cable built with a thickness of 22 feet. Construction for the base was extremely fast, taking only 4 months in total. The next step was the construction of the main support pillar for the tower. And this was done using an engineering feat that had never been attempted before. Using a raised slip form at the base, this concrete metal platform would raise itself on jacks 20 feet per day as the concrete below began to set. Concrete was poured from Monday to Friday with a small team of people supervising. To verify the vertical accuracy of the tower, massive plumb bobs were hung from the tower and they were observed using telescopes on the ground. This allowed for the accuracy of the tower to vary by only 29 millimeters over the height of the tower. And as the slip form rose with the hardening of the concrete, it would slowly decrease in size to produce the tapered contour of the finished tower. The tower's center core should be finished sometime this November, with all the work on the 1800-foot complex expected to be completed by early 1975. It is at that moment, as the CN Tower looms in stark relief against the backdrop of the city's skyline, that Metro Toronto can lay just claim to the tallest superstructure in the world, dethroning the current record holder, the Ostakino Tower in Moscow. But right now, it takes a highly vivid imagination to picture just how this $21 million edifice will look. On the drawing board, its facilities appear as varied as they are impressive. For an admission fee yet to be set, the public will enter the tower amid the lush greenery and reflecting pools that will carpet the base. Then they'll be whisked up over 1,100 feet to the main observation level. It's a trip taking 60 seconds and made in one of four glass-encased elevators running up the outside of the tower's sheer concrete facade. CN officials were leery about how some people might react to such a ride, so they called in a consulting psychologist, and he came up with the solution. Tape several black stripes on the face and sides of the transparent elevators, giving passengers the reassurance that there is indeed something substantial between them and the empty space outside. But for the truly faint of heart, there will be a conventional elevator running up the center core to the hub of the seven-tiered sky pod. Because of the tower's unique architectural design, there have been problems, but they have been surprisingly few and minor. For example, engineers discovered that just like plants, the CN Tower has a tendency to lean towards the sun. And still another structural peculiarity, this one at the tower's three-pronged base. The two northerly legs seem to want to turn in a counterclockwise direction, while the southerly leg shows a decided preference for moving clockwise. If this went unchecked, engineers say it could turn the tower into the shape of a corkscrew. So every week or so, minute adjustments are made to take this architectural oddity into account. And there is one other minimal problem, that of finding a more prestigious, grandiose address for the tower. As of now, it's 41 John Street, but as one CN official put it, that's hardly an appropriate address befitting the tallest building in the world. Tony Hillman, CBC News, Toronto. On February 22, 1974, the structure had officially become the tallest structure in Canada, passing the Inco Superstack that was built in Sudbury. To construct the concrete portion of the tower, 40,000 cubic meters of concrete was used. The next step was to construct the main level. This began in August of 1974 through the use of 45 hydraulic jacks that were attached to a temporary steel crown at the top of the tower by cables, 12 steel brackets were also raised. It took a week for the jacks to crawl up to the top of the tower to their final portion. These brackets would support the main level, which was built of concrete poured over wooden frames attached to rebar at the bottom level of the deck, then reinforced with large steel compression. The construction of this main level was described as building a seven-story building 1,100 feet in the air. At the base of the main level is a donut-shaped structure called the radome. It protects the sensitive transmission equipment inside from the elements. It's a Teflon-coated fiberglass fabric that measures only 1 32nd of an inch, but it's strong enough for an adult male to stand on. It balloons out to a size five times its normal size to maintain constant pressure over the equipment. The most recognizable part of the structure is, of course, the large antenna that rises above the main platform. At first, the plan was to raise this by crane, but the United States had sold a Sikorsky S64 Sky Crane to civilian operators, and the plan was changed to use that helicopter. 
The helicopter, which gained the nickname of Olga, removed the crane and then flew the antenna to the top of the structure in 36 sections. During the removal of the crane used during assembly, the helicopter became tethered to the tower when a section of boom seized in place. Workers scrambled to free the aircraft before it ran out of fuel, and with only 14 minutes to spare, workers managed to melt the metalwork that had caused the problem. The flights to the top of the antenna were a tourist attraction and the schedule was printed in the newspaper so people could watch. Thanks to the use of the helicopter, months of construction time was saved. This allowed for the construction of the antenna to take only three and a half weeks rather than six months. The heaviest piece of the antenna that had to be moved was eight tons. The main thing which sets the CN Tower apart from every other major development in this town is the degree of community interest. Today, for example, school children are here, signing their names to the final top section of the giant tower. Not many people get a chance to have their name put on the top of a, the highest structure. When my friend comes over, I can say to him, like I have my, the, my name on the, the highest building in the world. How about you, ma'am? Why are you putting your name down there? I think it's a great, great honor in this country to be able to have the highest standing structure after I stay. This is an uh, important moment in Toronto's history, and I want to be in it. With hair-raising precision, the giant chopper is positioned 40 feet away, and each seven-ton load gently lowered within a tolerance of just two inches. Only the rear seat pilot can see the load, and he talks down the load to the chopper's command pilot. Four electric hooks are then disconnected, and that's when the iron workers move in. They work around the clock, inserting and tightening the thousands of bolts which make the antenna mast a single unit. Buffeted by 100 mile an hour down blast from the prop of the chopper, working when their fingers are blue with cold, they still keep ramming home those bolts. But for most of them, it sure beats working in an office. How, how close have you been to death? Oh, I don't know. Probably coming down the Gardner Expressway is my <laughs> yeah, biggest problem. But I guess every step you take, every hour you're up there, you have to be very careful. Same oh, yeah. thing like baking on the weekend. <laughs> you bake cookies. Same like your wife bakes cookies on the weekend, you get used to it. It's in your blood. Once you become uh, used to the height, you get used to it. That's all there is to it. Is, is, that, is that the key not to, not to look down? No, no, no. Looking down doesn't bother you. It's looking up. It's looking up, yeah. looking up the book. It's looking up the throw shaft, your balance. You have nothing to relate to. If you're standing on top of something and you look at the sky and the clouds move, you have absolutely nothing to relate to. But you're leaning up against something. And it throws you off your balance. Otherwise, you're okay. Do you wear belts the whole time you're up there? No, we can't because uh, we have to be able to move out of the way quickly if, uh, if a piece happens to come down too quickly or something. So when we're bolting up, we do. And we're, we're fitting, uh, but as we're putting the pieces in, no. Those of you who are married, uh, do your wives worry about the kind of work you do? They just don't bother looking. That's all. <laughs> yeah. They just don't want to think about it. They're used to it. Yes. How about your wife, Paul? Are no, I don't, I don't think so. She, uh, she, <laughs> I don't know, we've never really talked about it. If you guys could get the same job on the ground paying as much money, would you do it on the ground? Would you rather work on the ground? It, it makes no difference. No, no, it hurts when you there. look up in the air and you see somebody else up somebody there. You want to get up there yourself yeah. and tackle it. And talking of, talking of dough, a lot of people say, I bet they make a fortune up there. What, what sort of money do you make? Well, we're working a lot of overtime right now, so we're pulling in about $20,000, $1,200 a week. How much? $1,000, $1,200 a week. But we're working seven days a week for that. On April 2nd, 1975, 26 months after construction started, the tower was topped off. At this point, it had captured the height record that would hold for decades, and it officially became the world's tallest freestanding structure on March 31, 1975, rising to 1,815.3 feet. If it was a typical building with floors, it would have 147 stories. Ross McWinter, the editor of the Guinness Book of World Records, was on hand for the event, and Paul Mitchell, a foreman on the project, had the honor of topping off the tower. When construction had finished, the total mass of the structure was an astounding 118,000 tons. Construction cost $63 million or $278 million in today's funds, and this was repaid in only 15 years. In all, 1,537 people worked on the job 24 hours a day, 5 days a week. For the workers, pay varied depending on where they worked. Iron worker Larry Porter made $8.01 an hour, a dollar more than the individuals a thousand feet below. 
Today, the hazard pay would be about $42 per hour. At the time, there was little safety in terms of working at these heights. Most contractors did have a safety harness that hooked around the chest and the arms, but if a contractor slipped, they would most likely slip out of the harness. Even with this, only one person died during construction of the CN Tower. Jack Ashton, a consultant with the Concrete Inspection Company, was hit in the head by a falling piece of plywood, which broke his neck and killed him instantly. But nobody died from working at the tall heights due to falling. On June 26, 1976, the structure was opened to the public in a ceremony that included Finance Minister Donald MacDonald, stilt walkers, and several others. Roger Tickner, a 7-foot-tall kitchen equipment manager, and 6-foot-3 Paula Lishman activated the exterior lights as the clock hit midnight. Paul King would write for the Toronto Star, quote, The only place higher that man's ever stood on a stationary base, except for a mountain peak, is the moon. On Earth, man can climb no higher in any enclosed structure. End quote. The crowd began gathering during the evening for the midnight opening. Eventually, there were several hundred people, among them a carefully selected group of tall people. At six foot five inches, Federal Finance Minister Donald MacDonald got the nod to throw the switch, turning on the tower's lights. It was timed for one minute past midnight. By mistake, the minister hit the switch a minute early. We have to wait 24 hours to do it again. However, it still triggered the lights. Today, the main crowd arrived for opening day. A single elevator ride to the very top would cost $3.75. That would make $12.50 for a family of four. But visitors faced upwards of an hour and a half in line. The holdup was at the ticketing desk, where visitors just couldn't be processed fast enough. On top of the tower's observation decks, about 400 people wandered around an area that could easily have held 1,200, had it not been for the first day holdups at the ground. The comment visitors like the most comes at the top, after the high-speed elevator ride high above the city. The CN elevator guide says, thank you for flying CN. Joe Cote, CBC News, Toronto. In 1979, Dar Robinson, a stuntman, jumped off the CN Tower for a scene in the movie High Point, for which he was paid $250,000 or $850,000 today. He then jumped again in 1980, as part of a personal documentary. On June 26, 1986, to mark the 10-year anniversary of the tower's opening, Dan Goodwin, a high-rise firefighter in a sponsored publicity event, used his hands and feet to climb on the outside of the tower, and he performed the feat twice in one day. On September 12, 2007, three decades after it took the record, the CN Tower was no longer the world's tallest freestanding structure. Holding the title for 34 years, only the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, and the Great Pyramid of Giza spent more time as the world's tallest. That being said, the CN Tower remains the tallest freestanding structure in the Western Hemisphere, almost 100 feet taller than the Willis Tower in Chicago, and 12 feet taller than the One World Trade Center in New York. The tower continues to hold the record for the world's highest public observation gallery, the world's highest glass floor paneled elevator, the world's longest metal staircase, the world's highest and largest revolving restaurant, the world's highest bar, and the world's highest wine cellar. The tower is also one of the safest in the world in terms of its height. One example is the elevator control. In the event of a power failure, five diesel generators supply emergency power within 10 seconds. If an elevator exceeds a certain speed or starts to fall, the most distance it can fall is 1.83 meters due to devices that jam the elevator into the elevator shaft. Wind resistance is another important feature of the building. While the CN Tower will sway in extreme winds, it handles up to 418 kilometers per hour. Inside the antenna, two 10-ton swinging counterparts ensure that the tower never exceeds acceptable conditions. Armor-plated windows also prevent the windows from breaking in extreme wind. In 1995, the CN Tower was listed as one of the seven wonders of the modern world by the American Society of Civil Engineers. In non-COVID times, 1.5 million people a year visit the tower. It also serves as a workplace for 500 people through the year, and its telecommunications antennas serve 16 Canadian television and FM radio stations. 
and each year the tower earns roughly $72 million in revenue. I hope you enjoyed that look at the CN Tower and its construction, and if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy Hayden Doug Campbell Reg W Deborah Carlson Francis Helbling Randall McCallum Diane Wade, Lori Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-E-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Information comes from Canadian Encyclopedia, Wikipedia, CN Tower, T-Shots.com, Dozer Hub, IEE Canada, Spacing.ca, and CBC. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.